from the ground. Is there a cost, though, to what some people are calling Mongolia? That's coming up on the program. Mongolia to most people and they'll probably all think the same thing. Somewhere distant and desolate but beneath those truths lie a Mongolia that few know about. A boom country and one of the world's fastest growing economies. And beneath the surface of this, the vast Gobi Desert, lies one of the world's biggest mining projects. One that promises to change the of the country forever. Justin Rowlett now reports from the Oil Togi mine in the Gobi Desert. I'm in the middle of the Gobi Desert, one of the most isolated places on the planet, and I will show you why I'm here. Take a look at this. Oh. Can you see these, uh, these kind of green markings on the rock, turquoise markings? That shows that this rock contains a lot of copper. And I'm here because this is one of the biggest mining developments on the planet. Take a look at this. They've only just opened this mine out up. It started in August, and look at what they've done. Up here, this vast pit has opened up. Each of those trucks that you see down there is literally, literally the size of a house. They've got these great big diggers tearing away at the side of the hill. Because underneath where I'm standing is one of the biggest untouched mineral reserves in the entire world. A huge body of copper, of gold, and of silver. They say it's the size of the island of Manhattan. And when this mine is fully operational, it will contribute a third of the GDP of this entire country of Mongolia. A third of Mongolia's GDP. Samad Sandoj was part of the team that discovered the vast deposit here. He's now a vice president of the Oyu Tolgoi mine. Initially, we just started the exploration and then we started drilling and it was very exciting and it became more and more bigger and bigger <laughs> and expanded and we reached this time. And this is the result of all of that? This is the huge facilities, uh, the result of that work. And once the mine goes into full production, the revenues should transform this traditional and underdeveloped country forever. Justin Rola, BBC News, Mongolia. Incredible pictures there. Well, in a minute we're going to speak to a few people who know Mongolia well. But I thought first it would be a good idea to give you some essential facts about the country. First of all, where is it? Well, Mongolia is sandwiched in between Russia and China. It is the 19th biggest country in the world. Mongolia's most famous figure in history is Genghis Khan, who founded what would eventually become the world's largest empire. The traditional drink in Mongolia is fermented horse's milk. I'm told it's an acquired taste. And the world's biggest horse can be found in statue form in the capital, Ulaanbaatar. Last year, the economy grew 12.3% after growth of 17%, staggering figures the year before. And listen to this figure. Mongolia thought to have $1.3 trillion in mineral resources. Boom times indeed. Well, with me here in the studio is Enshkilgal Dan Sanbaldia, the chief representative of the Bank of Mongolia here in London. John Mann, who is a travel writer and historian who is focused on Mongolia. And Dasha Veg Tesanbat, the head of the Association of Mongolians here in the UK. Thank you all very much for joining me here on Impact. And Kia, if I could start with you, how controversial is mining in Mongolia at the moment? Of course, the mining is the, the, the key economic sector uh, to make this uh, stagnant high economic growth. And a lot of people are benefiting from mining. But uh, the mining also has uh, some challenges. Uh, uh, we would like to develop the mining sector as environmentally friendly. And uh, that's why civil societies and uh, some of uh, uh, local people are not happy about uh, uh, the mining. Is there, are there laws, are there regulations in place to protect the environment? Yes, and the government uh, has uh, uh, a new policy and they restructured the, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the Ministry of Environment to Ministry of Environment and Green Development. 
the basically encouraging the, uh, the miners uh, uh, to look after the nature. We brought up in a way that uh, uh, we respect, appreciate our nature. And my parents raised the way that uh, I shouldn't drop even single drop of milk or any dirty thing to the river. But, but uh, that you were hearing that and you're looking at those incredible pictures. You've got trucks there the size of houses digging into the Gobi Desert. Yeah. There must be some real concern. Yes, uh, it's, of course it's a transformational opportunity for Mongolia, but it needs to be managed rightly. Are so. people worried that it's not being though? No, it's, it's just a... Uh, no. Currently, actually, in November, there were online TV debate between two MPs. The one is questioning the contract agreement, uh, retail by agreement, and one is explaining the who is actually signed the contract, well, why it's good for Mongolia. Other one is questioning why it's, the contract is not good for Mongolia. So after that debate, the several issues emerged on the public domain. So one seems uh, uh, one of the issues people are asking is now the why the initial investment cost raised is it? It's about four billion US dollars in an initial feasible study. So now it's six billion and those kind of issues. But because the public are asking all those questions, so now the government and Rotent are discussing about all these issues. Thank you. The contract has been written between the government and Rio Tinto. One of the provisions is that the money that Rio Tinto, the mining company, are spending, just billions and billions of dollars, has to be paid back before the Mongolians see any of the profit. Uh, do people think that's fair? Mm. The, uh, uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, uh, we are learning by doing. Because this is the, the biggest uh, that ever we had uh, the stability investment agreement. And I think that both sides uh, 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 need to uh, uh, agree and to improve uh, what we've done. Why not? And so uh, uh, life is uh, uh, very rich and uh, uh, we have to listen to our people's interests as well. John, I think we have some pictures of the modern day Ulaanbaatar, which is probably one that 10 years ago you never would have recognised. How have you seen things change already in the country? Oh, well, the, mining... first, the first time I went there, there was, it was hardly a traffic light. Uh, and all the buses were ancient and now you can't move for traffic and the growth of the the city is phenomenal I and mean, there's a huge property boom, lots of rich hotels, and it's only just started. I mean, just to tell people what we're seeing now, Burberry, Louis Vuitton, there's designer boutiques, there's expensive restaurants, yes. but there's still huge poverty. I mean, I was reading a story about people still having to go underground to huddle by the pipes to keep warm in the winter. Yes, I don't know how that's faring now, but if you go to Ulan Bata today, you see around the outside a lot of people still living in tents. And this is, a, this is a big problem because uh, they burn um, coal uh, and there's a great deal of pollution, which I understand is now being cleared up a bit. It's a bit better, isn't it? Only in the winter but, uh, time. Yeah. I think there is a huge question, though, about whether the wealth is going to cool down from those that currently have it to the ordinary Mongolians. We have a, a piece of uh, the interview that Justin did with a young man who lives in Mongolia. That's his concern. Let's have a listen. How big a problem do you think corruption is here in Mongolia? Thank you. You say the country is, is still learning as they go. But what about those particular accusations that we heard from that young man there? There were two, really, that ordinary people are not going to see the benefits of this wealth and also this huge concern about corruption. Yes, uh, when we are growing, there is the discrepancy between the rich and the poor, and we have a lot of challenges, and we have also a lot of risks, and the uh, government and we are facing it, uh, and the corruption is one of the problems, and uh, uh, the government created a special agency, anti-corruption agency, and requested the, and asked the, all of the civil servants to disclose their revenues and properties, what they owned. And these kind of uh, the, uh, policies and measures would definitely reduce 
the, the, uh, the corruption problems. In addition to that, the Mongolia is a very much uh, democratic country. We only have a very years, though. Only yes, democracy and we have a lot of TVs, a lot of uh, uh, the newspapers, and uh, also internet websites. And uh, uh, that's the good thing compared to my uh, neighbors. Uh, and everything would be discussed so easily. And that would uh, reduce this problem of the corruption. Hello. So people need to be involved uh, in this kind of uh, uh, things uh, to help the just, government uh, to I mean, reduce the, uh, uh, this corruption. Sorry to interrupt, Basha, but do, do you believe this, yeah, that you, know, you live in the UK now, but do you think that your family back in Mongolia are going to benefit, that corruption is going to be dealt with? The IMF says only 71% of income from these mines is going to go back to Mongolians. Do you think that the country will really benefit? Yes, yeah, the, the ordinary people. The, yeah, that's the main our interest on our nation. So everyone wants to get some benefit from this mine and boom. So uh, as Inke pointed out, uh, we have a 20 years, of, as you said, 20 years of democracy experience, and the main achievement we had is a freedom of speech. So people can question our government. So why are you doing this one? Why? It's, it's well known factor is the corruption is the main issue in Mongolia. So the, as a democratic, democratic country, we are still in infant stage. We need to uh, look out our legislation system and everything in the right way. John, one of the things that I've been reading about today is the concern in Mongolia over China. Some Mongolians feel they are ultimately going to be uh, the beneficiaries of all of this. The Mongolia is being dug up, but literally it's being sold to, to China. Yes. One phrase I even heard was the country is going to be called Mongolia. Yes. It's very close, though, to China, where all this mining is taking place. But it seems obvious to, to provide a lot of what comes out of the earth to China. They need it. They do indeed need it, but it, there's a long term, there's a tremendous problem. It's very fascinating to see uh, who owns this mine, who owns what's underneath the soil. Do the herders own it? Do the government own it? Do the foreigners, do the foreign investors own it? Will China own it? And there is a very long-term view to be taken here because so much in Mongolia goes back to Genghis, Genghis Khan. We, we must say Genghis or Chinggis, not Genghis. Okay. Uh, and he's established the world's greatest land empire. He had a vision of world rule, which is, of course, quite crazy, as we now know, but he didn't know what the world consisted of. When he died in 1227, that vision was finally inherited by his grandson, Kublai Khan. And it was Kublai Khan who created, in effect, modern China by conquering all of China. A remarkable achievement for uh, a so-called barbarian. Uh, and. He brought into China those areas of China which hadn't been traditionally part of it. That is Tibet, Xinjiang, Yunnan, and of course Mongolia itself. So who owns China? Who owns Mongolia? is very much up for dispute, and that whole border is likely to become porous. I just wanted to ask both of you. It's so we're so lucky to have you here in the studio. It's not often we get members of the Mongolian community here. But is there a, a worry that there'll be a resource curse for the country? That the nomadic lifestyle that has existed for hundreds of years, tourism, other things that the country defines itself by its very being is now going to completely change because all you'll have is the mines. Yes, there is a worry because they're natural resource course is the, the common knowledge for the world and we are the country trying to avoid that natural resource course and trying to uh, use this resource efficiently to other ordinary Mongolians and and you very briefly, what do you think? The Mongolian people are aware about this uh, natural cost. Uh, we will, uh, we all working to make the natural cost to natural blessing. And uh, 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 the mining is not only uh, the source of uh, our economic development or growth. We have an agriculture sector. We have a 40 million heads of animals. And our animals, uh, the, the, our cashmere, our meat are very much uh, value for the, the future economic development. And 40% uh, of the population are working on agriculture sector. But uh, in the mining sector, only 100,000. Thank so uh, 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 we believe that uh, tourism is another the vast opportunity. Well, looking at the picture behind us of the Gobi yes. Desert, I can see why tourism would be as well. Thank you all very much for joining us. It's been lovely to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Do stay with us here on BBC World News. Plenty more coming up.